Stephen King is one of the most well-known and prolific writers of the last hundred years. Also, one of my favorites. He's been the inspiration for many of my own novels, and his tips have helped millions to write their own stories. But I think his writing advice can slide right into the DMs of game mastering advice with only a little bit of adjustment. A couple decades ago, King published a memoir slash writing advice book named On Writing, and we're going to mine it for stuff to help you improve running your games. Let's dig in. Number one. First, write for you, and then worry about others. When you write a story, you're telling yourself the story. When you rewrite, your main job is to take out the things that are not the story. I think we all know that the GM's primary job is to provide a playground where your players can run around, skin their knees, and start fights with the other children. But you, GM, have to remember that you are also a player at the table. You should be creating NPCs that are fun to play. You should be making worlds that you enjoy. You should be creating toys that are fun to watch others play with. When King says write for yourself, I don't view that in a selfish light at all. If you are running a campaign for a tabletop RPG and you are not enjoying yourself, then it's going to come out at the table. Sure, sometimes the story veers into directions you might not have chosen, but if you learn to find the fun in the chaos, then you'll always be pleasantly surprised when things change course. 2. Don't use passive voice. Timid writers like passive verbs for the same reason that timid lovers like passive partners. The passive voice is safe. This might seem like technical advice, but I think we can find the lesson here in being active. Sometimes players will foof and faff and plod and spend time doing nothing at all. And a little bit of that is fine, but we don't want the pace to lag for too long. Sometimes you need to create the conflict. Don't be afraid to have an ogre kick down the door. Don't be afraid to have that treasured NPC suddenly betray the party to spice things up. Players love to be surprised, and sometimes you gotta take big swings to make that happen. In Campaign 1 of Wizards and Wordslingers, I had fire giants destroy the city of Baldur's Gate. I needed something huge and catastrophic to happen, and that fit the bill nicely. Don't be scared to shake things up and make sweeping changes to the realm or its denizens. It helps to make the world more believable. Things permanently change in real life all the time, right? Number 3. Write one word at a time. Whether it's a vignette of a single page or an epic trilogy like Lord of the Rings, the work is always accomplished one word at a time. It's very easy to want to plan out 5,000 years of history for your campaign, to detail a dozen cities, two dozen interconnected factions, and 50 NPCs. But slow your roll, bruh. Spiral Campaign Design says to start small and local and then work your way out to the larger world. I think it's fine to have vague notions of bigger concepts, but you don't want to make too many concrete details at the start. You leave yourself too little room to experiment or add things as you go. When I was planning the world of Tyrodon for the second campaign of Wizards and Wordslingers, I had to force myself to keep most of the map blank. I came up with names and simple details of the five largest cities, but I only added districts and landmarks and prominent NPCs to the city close to where I knew my players would start. Otherwise, you run the risk of wasting too much work. Remember, a good portion of the GMing happens between the sessions once you know where the PCs are headed next. You don't have to start off with all the answers or even all the questions. Number four, stick to your own style. One cannot imitate a writer's approach to a particular genre no matter how simple what that writer is doing may seem. You've probably heard of the Mercer effect or whatever they call watching too much Dimension 20 and Brennan Lee Mulligan. I love both of those DMs, but I can't do myriad accents or paint verbal pictures like Mercer, and I can't improv at the speed of light like Brennan. I'll never be on par with those two at those things. That's fine, because I have my own style that works for me. That's not to say I don't learn from Matt Mercer or BLM, because I love taking inspiration from those two masters of their craft. But whatever your vibe is at the table, if your players are having a good time, then you're killing it. You're a superstar. You don't need to do anything differently. Number 5. Kill Your Darlings Kill Your Darlings is one of the most misunderstood bits of writing advice ever given. I've seen all kinds of weird interpretations of this, but it basically means kill your darlings dot 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 if they're not working. For a writer, this means that sometimes you have to axe a treasured scene or even a whole character if it's not right for the story, often because it wrecks the pacing or tone or duplicates something pre-existing that already accomplishes the same goal. In TTRPGs, GMs have to be okay with the prospect of huge chunks of their lore, locations, NPCs, and other bits of prepared material going unused. You stock that tavern with half a dozen super cool NPCs with awesome backstories and tantalizing potential adventure hooks. 
but the players are only interested in chatting up the goblin piano player and no one else. It happens. Sometimes you have to shelve an encounter or even a whole level of a dungeon because everything before it took too long. It happens. Sometimes the players figure out your plot twist way before you intended them to, and now you have to change everything that comes after. It happens. GMing is chaos, and you can't expect anything less. So kill your darlings when you need to, because you'll have more later. I promise. Number six, the research shouldn't outweigh the story. Remember that word back. That's where the research belongs, as far in the background and backstory as you can get it. It's tempting to lore drop, especially when you put so much damn time and effort into it. Sometimes I have to remind myself that the lore and backstory is the plate, not the meal being served upon it. It's there to support the story, not become the story itself. Say your players come upon a strange obelisk by the side of the road. They take one look at it and go, mm, probably a trap, let's skip it and get to the dungeon. And your poor GM heart breaks in two. Your players may not ever get to hear the full thousand word history of that fascinating obelisk and deal with the exciting encounter you created around it. But take comfort in the fact that you had fun making that encounter and writing that history. You can always reflavor it as something else later, or give the PCs a specific reason to intentionally revisit the location, or even use it as is in a different campaign. Recycling is one of the GM's best secret weapons. Hey, that sounds like a quotable line. Let's see that on the screen. There we go. Finally, you become a writer by reading and writing. You learn best by reading a lot and writing a lot, and the most valuable lessons of all are the ones you teach yourself. This should be obvious how this translates to running tabletop role-playing games. If you want to get good, you gotta run games and play in games, both sides of the GM screen. Different systems, different groups, online and in person. You actually can learn TTRPGs through osmosis, so get as much experience as you can in as many different ways as you can. Watch video actual plays and listen to podcasts, but realize that playing the game yourself is infinitely more valuable than watching someone else play it. And I think that's about all the advice Mr. King has to offer us. I don't think he is my top favorite writer, but just by sheer word count, I've read more of his stuff than anyone else's. I still have vivid memories of not being able to read It After Dark because Pennywise scared the crap out of me. Ugh. The Shining, The Stand, The Dark Half, these are the stories that defined my early teenage years. Someday I would love to run The Dark Tower as a D&D campaign. That would be amazing. But until then, I'll keep reading and writing and playing and running games because it's the secret to success. Until next time, this is GM Jim. Now go out there and do it.